the basis of everything that I showed here at the end of the day is what we call in computer science algorithms. What is an algorithm? Do you have, do you know? Have you heard about this? Uh, this word you probably did. How would you define what is an algorithm? It's a way, it's like a recipe to solve a problem. Okay? Sometimes we face a problem and computers by themselves uh, cannot, of course, solve it. We need, as programmers or as system engineers, we need to create the recipe. Uh, and in the case of medical data, we need to see how we slice and dice the data in order to uh, come up with a solution. So uh, for uh, the first example, we will see in this course many uh, algorithms, many medical data mining algorithms. But for the first example of an algorithm, I chose something very nice. And this is a problem that we have with, uh, ans with time series, with medical data, uh, med uh, medical uh, time series. Uh, this is usually the case where a patient uh, comes uh, to give blood every few days or weeks, and we measure whatever uh, variable that we uh, measure over time. Okay, so this is how it looks like, and what this um, chart shows is that the only information, the only data that we have about uh, the level of, of, uh, of uh, the variable that we measure is only at the days that that patient came and gave blood. We don't know what happened between two different uh, time points. And what usually we do is just connecting the dots, of course. And this is a, a kind of interpretation and kind of interpolation that does not necessarily uh, um, is not necessarily authentic, does not necessarily represent the real uh, situation in the body. And this is something that you know is very, very, very common. Probably you've seen hundreds or thousands of graphs like this. Because usually, or we can say alternately, al alternatively, what the interpretation could be is something like this. Instead of really different uh, uh, fluctuations of the, in this case, it's a viral load, maybe we have one phase of a decrease of the viral load because, I don't know, maybe the, the immune system were, was able to fight the variants, and then there was some kind of a, a maybe, um, uh, how do you say, um, resistance, and then another phase that we were able to get rid of the virus. And the goal when we try to analyze medical time series is to get to the point where one segment equals one biological phase or process. So each segment represents a different time, a different uh, scenario, a different era in the complex interactions between the, in this case, pathogen, uh, the human cells, the host, and the immune system and maybe the drug uh, that the host takes. And therefore, when we have such data, such time series data, we need to detect the phase transition. We need to define the critical points that transfer from that move or represents the move from one era to another era, from one biological process to another biological process. And as you can see, there could be different and totally different interpretation of the different phases, of the different eras in the human body, in the immune process. How many, now if I ask you this, how many if I just uh, try to detect the critical points not more than that because there's, there are other options but if I just try to say each point whether it is critical or not whether it is a transition point or not this is the only question for each point whether it is a transition point or not how many options do you think I have not me the computer two, two? what do you mean there's something to it what do you mean by two to know whether it's uh, going up or going down okay. for the same point, either it is or not. This is true. Okay, very good. So for each point that we have here, and you can see that there are different interpretations, for each point we have actually two options, whether it is a critical point or not a critical point. However, 
there are many points. So it's two times for each, or two options for each point. And if you think about it, the complexity or the number of options for that is 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of points. And you were, we, you were right that the first and last points are outside of the game. This is why we write it as 2 to the power of n minus 2. And this notation that you see with O, big O, and then uh, the formula in brackets, this is the way we write the complexity, which means the number of options that the computer needs to scan in order to decide what is the best option. So there are so many options. And just to you know, make sense, this is the number of options at different uh, values of n. So if you have five data points, we will have 32 options. If we have 10 data points, we will have 1,000 options. But if we have 30 options, we will see here, uh, how much is that? One trillion options, if I'm not mistaken, or 35, 34 uh, trillion options if it's 35 points and think about it. And this is a very, very uh, hard problem. And uh, this is because um, 2 to the power of n, maybe it doesn't look like a big number, but it's a huge number. And there are different uh, uh, trivia um, in, um, questions about it. For example, how many, what is the number of atoms in planet Earth? 2 to the power of 80. I don't think anyone have ever checked, but <laughs> this is what scientists say. So it's an enormous number, and this very, very little problem is actually uncomputable. No computer in the world, and even not all computers together, if they work together, can calculate the, all the different options of just uh, a very few, a, a few dozens of data points. So, in order to solve that, we use, because this is not computable, we use uh, algorithms. And these algorithms are from a family that is called heuristic algorithms, that you can see here. Heuristics means it's like an educated guess. We, will not, we are not able to really count and, and test all the different combinations of critical data points, and therefore we will make some guesses, some educational guesses, created by the algorithms uh, that will be able to uh, make the problem uh, uh, more solvable. And of course, let's not forget that it's not just a mathematical question, it's also a biological question, let's call it that way, because there is a, there is a trade of, there is an in inherent problem here with uh, the uh, question, how many segments do I want? How many critical points do I want? If I make few segments, then um, it makes more sense because probably there are not so many different biological processes. However, the difference, the distance between the line and the points, the error, let's call it, is larger. We use the, uh, the term RMS uh, to measure this uh, distance. RMS is root mean square. The root mean square of the distance between the actual data points that were measured and our interpretation, which is that curve, that uh, piecewise linear curve. And of course, if I make many, many, many segments, that's good. RMS is lower, but then um, it doesn't really uh, represent, um, probably doesn't represent the good or the true nature of the biological processes. So these are two contradicting goals. We want, on one hand, to decrease the RMS distance, and on the other hand, to decrease the number of segments. It's not really uh, possible. We need to find a good trade-off uh, between them. Okay, now, in order to think about an algorithm that will solve that, we need to make some basic assumption or some initial assumption. And in this case, I say, let's say that I know what is the correct number of segments. That God spoke to me and I know what is the correct number of segments. And do you want me to tell you what is the correct number of segments? K. K. Okay? This is when mathematicians and computer scientists, they, they don't know something, so they say K. Okay? Okay, so let's say we know that for sure, for that patient, we have K different segments. 
still, from the complexity point of view, uh, there is another formula. If you know this formula called selection, so I need to select k minus 1 points out of a pool of n minus 2 points. It's still a very, very complex. This is the formula, but it's still not computable. Okay, so it's better than uh, the former one, but not really. It's more or less the same kind of complexity, same kind of problems. I cannot compute all the different options. All right, so if these are not computable, here is uh, the first algorithm that you will see that tries to solve this problem. It's very intuitive. It's called the sliding window algorithm. When what the sliding window algorithm tries to do is to begin with just connecting the first two dots with one phase, with one segment, and then enlarge that segment, measure the RMS, and as long as the RMS is uh, below a certain threshold, we can continue. So right now the RMS, the distance between the point and the curve, is is below that threshold, so we can continue. Maybe this time it's above the th that threshold, so we will go back. And then we continue and enlarge it, enlarge it. N maybe now it's too big, so we go back. And so on and so forth, go back. And here we can make a really big uh, segment that was breaking here. Voila! Here is the solution. How many clicks did I make? Very few, right? And so the complexity in this case is, is much, much, much simpler. And we have a very good uh, interpretation that takes into account really a, a very logical parameter, which is what is that threshold? How far do we allow the points to be from the curve? How far do we let the actual data be from our interpretation? What do you think about this algorithm? In, in, in this course, many times I will ask you, what do you think? And you, when you make algorithms, you need to, to think about how good or bad this algorithm is. What do you think about it? It can predict the future. It can predict the future? What do it cannot predict the future. <laughs> it cannot <laughs> predict the future. Okay. Now, so, but, but uh, now I'll give you another tip, okay? Uh, as an algorithmician, many times your world is as limited. <laughs> I, I didn't ask about the future. I said, this is the data, this is the input, this is the output that I would like to get. How do you assess? the quality of that algorithm or this output given this input. Okay? What do you think about it? What is your intuition? It's very similar to the original. So similar to the original that checks all the options. Mm -hmm. that's, good, that's good because checking all the options assures mm -hmm. that you get the, the best mm -hmm. solution, right? And this is very similar. Okay, but uh, of course in much less time, right? This is computable. This is much quicker. Okay, other thoughts? Okay. So, this is an algorithm that we call greedy. This is the nature of this algorithm. It is greedy. And why, what do I mean? If I go back in time, Right? I created the first segment here, okay? Because it made sense then, okay? If I wanted to enlarge it, I had a, a, a bigger RMS, so I didn't enlarge it, I made it here. However, only then, only after I made that decision, did I go to make all other decisions. Mm -hmm. But maybe once I'll see now the big picture, I would say, you know what? It actually makes more sense not to make the first segment here, to make the first segment here. So it will be me go down and then up. Okay. It will, of course, cost more in RMS, but eventually make more sense. And uh, greedy algorithms cannot do such kind of thinking, such kind of calculations, because once they make a decision, then this decision is fixed, they go to 
keep uh, go to solve the next problem. So this is a greedy algorithms, and we know for sure for greedy algorithms that many times they don't find the optimal solution. So maybe and very probably there's another solution, another selection of critical points of transition point that for the same number of segments will find a lower RMS value. And therefore, this interpretation does not really represent or has less chances to represent the true nature in the biology of the body. Okay, so this is not such a good algorithm. So let's see a different algorithm. It's called the top-down algorithm. And it's really smart. What it says is something like this. I begin with one phase, one segment. And then I try to check what happens if I break it at different time points. Okay? What happens if I break it here, or break it here, or break it here, or break it here, and so on. And for each of those options, I will see how my RMS improves. Okay? And I will choose the option that it, imp it improves the most. So from all options, I made this test here. This is the point that decreases the RMS value the most. And then, I'm so fortunate, the next thing I need to do is just run the same algorithm on those two segments. So it's like I, I ran it on one segment in the beginning, now I will run it on a, just again on each of those segments. So if I do that, you can see here the different uh, points. Unfortunately, and b b probably it's very uh, apparent here, that this algorithm is also greedy, right? It suffers from the same problem. Once I made that initial decision, then it's fixed. I cannot change it back. And I made that decision on very few data that I had, right? I just checked uh, n different options. I didn't see the whole picture and what will happen in the future. And I repeated this greedy selection each and every time. So this algorithm also does not assure us that we will, we will receive the correct solution or the correct representation or correct interpretation of what happens in the body. And now the question is to you. So you saw the sliding window algorithm, you saw the top-down algorithm. <coughs> Can you come up, first time, you'll have many such occasions. Can you invent now another algorithm? Bottom-up. Bottom-up, okay. You say, <laughs> it sounds, <laughs> sounds uh, logical. Actually, you are correct. Okay, how would a bottom-up algorithm look like? Each one is a segment. Say again? Each one is a segment. Each one is a segment, like each pair is a segment, and then what? You rebuild it. Uh, and then you rebuild it, you unite it. That's true. Okay, this is true. So this is your first made up algorithm, and uh, this is true. Um, let's just, uh, what's your name, by the way? Neta. Neta. Okay, so let's see it in action. This is a nice animation. So we begin with a state where we have all dots connected, and then we just unite adju uh, uh, two adju adjacent uh, segments. How do, we, how do we decide which segment, which two adjacent segments to, uh, to uh, uh, unite? One and two, two and three, three and four, four and five. How do we decide? RMS. RMS, exactly. The one that I each, each unification will increase RMS, unfortunately, we will choose the one that increases the list. Right. Very good, Neta. Bravo. What do you think about Neta algorithms? Amazing. Amazing. Amazingly greedy. <laughs> <laughs> this is also greedy. <laughs> So, unfortunately, again, we suffer from the same problem. We suffer from the problem that um, um, whenever we make a decision, let's say to unite the first two adjacent uh, segments, that decision is fixed. And that decision is made on partial information, and we cannot change it back. We can use the first algorithm, maybe. The sliding window? Just, just for example, and keep in mind the, the first case. So, 
some, so we uh, calculate two two things together and then decide which one. <laughs> Perfect. And this is what many people say. So just to repeat, she says, let's combine the two. Let's say, make something that combines, let's say, the bottom-up algorithm with the sliding window algorithm. That's true, and that's really uh, happening a lot. Uh, and you see, this is algorithmics. Thinking about, and it's very creative. People think about, you know, working with computers is something very dull, very gray. No, it's very creative. Well, unfortunately, uh, this also that solution is greedy. <laughs> okay, and but this is okay. In many times, these heuristic algorithms where we try to make such uh, calculated guesses, they are greedy. Now, let me give you a hint to an algorithm that is not greedy. Uh, you know, when we look at the problem or when we look at an algorithm, there's, it's a process. It's a process that begins in the beginning and ends at the end. And usually what happens is that in the beginning, we have a big problem. Let's say we have 100 points in this case. And as we progress in the process, the problem becomes smaller and smaller. That's true with the sliding window algorithm, right? It, we, we had like 100 points. But eventually, over time, we ended up with less and less and less. That's called a top-down design. It's not the top-down algorithm. It's called the top-down design, where we have a big problem, and we make it smaller, 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 smaller. And about 95% of all algorithms that you will see in, also in medical data mining, but all together, are from a top-down design approach. But there's another approach. It's called the bottom-up design. This, bo and again, it's not the bottom-up algorithm, it's the bottom-up design. It means that we begin actually like from uh, the process of, uh, we, we like go backward, okay? So we begin with a very small problem and then solve that small problem and then make that problem harder, make it harder and harder and harder. <coughs> and we reuse all solutions of the smaller problems that we solve in order to solve the bigger problem. Does that sound familiar? Something maybe that you've learned? Maybe in the formal semester? Yeah, dynamic programming. Ah, bravo. Very nice. Dynamic programming. So, uh, and, and dynamic program, programming is the best solution, uh, best example of bottom-up design. And uh, actually, bottom-up de design usually is much more cost-effective. The complexity usually it's much, 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 much better. Okay, so just to make sure, the sliding window algorithm that you show, that you've seen, is a top-down design. The top-down algorithm is a top-down design. And the bottom-up algorithm is also top-down design. So we want something else. And really, I, I used, uh, oh, I, for, for my uh, PhD research, I needed to use, uh, to do a lot of segmentations. And I used all the algorithms, top-down, bottom-up, uh, sliding window, everything, combination. But I felt that that approach that you know from a, a genetic ali ge a, a sequence alignment, right, from bioinformatics, can solve that. And I made a bet with a friend, with a colleague from another lab, that the same approaches as filling that matrix of the dynamic programming can be applicable for uh, time series segmentation. So, what was the result? I will tell you at the last lecture in the course. But for now, I give this challenge to you. Try to think how to solve the time series segmentation problem with the sequence alignment algorithm. Nice, right? OK. All right. Now, for the last part of the introduction, I would like to do something very, very important and very, very beautiful. I will uh, uh, show you 
different glances of the business ecosystem that supports uh, this great phenomenon of medical data mining.